Oh, really? Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Sorry, I'll stand back over here. First of all, my name is Jason Mishaj. I'm the Vice President of the American Club. And I want to thank all of you for coming on Sunday. It's nice to see so many familiar faces. Uh, also let you know, we have about 50 people on Zoom as well. So there actually are other people as well uh, listening in. Today is the second event that the American Club has planned around the presidential election uh, watch parties that we have is um, all coming into the election. The second one, which is today, is really more for you, our younger members. Um, and it's pretty important to know, and I will always say, presidential elections are really important. They are uh, confusing, though, at times. They're difficult to understand what, what matters, what's noise, et cetera. And if there's any two people on the planet to kind of help guide us to figure out uh, what makes sense and you know, how to navigate through all the issues that we have, we couldn't have two better people today. One person you might know very well, Meredith Haskins, humanities teacher at HKIS of the high school, and particularly teaches uh, AP government and politics. 
And on the line, we'll see in a second, uh, from Singapore is Steve Oaken. Uh, Steve is a great individual. He is a natural educator, actually, right? He makes all of this look really easy. The truth is, though, he definitely practices a lot. He gives a lot of different presentations to younger audiences, to older audiences. But the reason why he's probably a natural educator is that he's a gifted operator, right? He's been behind the scenes in presidential elections for the past three decades. He doesn't look that old, but he is. Um, but he's uh, an incredible individual. Um, and more importantly, I think uh, it's great that both Meredith and Steve took time today to be with us. So if you can, to help me welcome both Steve and Meredith, a big round of applause. Hi guys, um, hope to see you guys in the high school very soon. Um, so as a teacher of American government, uh, some of you may have done some studying of American government already, but it's really challenging to teach students how things are supposed to work in important documents like the Constitution and other foundational documents, and then explain to them how things seem to really work in the real world. Um, and it's hard to discern, you know, why are things happening? Why does it seem a little bit different than what I expected things to happen? And so it's difficult in a typical election year to try to figure that out. The, the mechanics, what's supposed to happen, and then how does politics alter or impact or influence what we see happening? And then if you think about it this year, we've got interactions, the normal presidential competitions, but that's enhanced and complicated by COVID, by foreign relations, by a uh, Supreme Court vacancy, and by very bitter partisan politics. Um, so fortunately, you guys are really lucky to have Steve uh, with you today to explain how some of this stuff works, because it is complicated um, and it's helpful to have somebody help break it down. So to give you a little bit more background, um, Steve's also served in the administration of President Clinton as the Deputy General Counsel at the U.S. Department of Transportation, and he's a frequent analyst on CNBC. Channel News Asia, and he also provides regular commentary to this, uh, the Straits Times in Singapore on US politics and government. Um, he is a chairman of AmCham in Singapore and is definitely well connected with uh, the political world and the business world. So if we could give Steve a warm welcome, right? Ready? <laughs> Do the tech stuff. So Steve, welcome to Hong Kong, right? And take it away. Thank you so much. I, you know, I wish uh, very much I was in Hong Kong uh, with you all, but we'll have to do this one, of course, uh, the, the COVID way through Zoom. Um, and this is a presentation I'm, I'm going to share with you. It's, um, it's one that, that primarily I do for adults. I've changed it just a little bit, but not too much, um, to really try and explain uh, what's happening um, in U.S. politics, how we got here and, and where we're going. And so we'll call this one the, uh, the back to school edition. Uh, as, as Jason uh, mentioned, I'm pretty old. So that's a, a picture of me a while back, back when I worked uh, uh, in the Clinton administration uh, with me and the president uh, in the White House. So I put this up to say, well, I am a Democrat. Um, I take my Democratic hat off. I keep my American hat on and really trying to explain what's happening and why it's happening from a non-partisan perspective, because it doesn't do you any good to hear spin uh, about, you know, why Joe Biden is better than Donald Trump. That, that doesn't work for today. So I take off my partisan hat and I'm going to play it uh, uh, straight down the middle. And, you know, to really kind of understand where we are today, you have to go all the way back to when the United States was founded. And, and our, our founding documents uh, that set up our government is the Constitution uh, of the United States. And the thing to remember, I think, the most about the Constitution is that our founders uh, of, of the United States knew that we were not a perfect union, that we were founded to become a more perfect union, because we had a lot of problems uh, when the country was founded. You know, first and foremost, of course, was, was slavery, which really divided uh, the country then. But we still have a lot of problems today. And so how you came up with these compromises, how we would work um, to try and become more perfect as we grew 
uh, is a country, um, set up the rules that, that, that of the game that, that we are playing now when it comes um, to both governing and um, campaigning. Um, and so if you saw the play Hamilton, you'll, you'll recognize a bit uh, of what I'm about to tell you. So I'm going to try and uh, uh, channel a little bit of uh, Lin-Manuel Miranda now with, without any of uh, his talent, of course. Right? And so the two main right, players in Hamilton, first, you had Alexander Hamilton, um, and second, you had Thomas Jefferson, Hamilton from the North, Jefferson from the South, Hamilton, who was in favor of business and in favor of finance, and um, Jefferson, who, who owned slaves himself, who was in favor um, you know, of, of, of farmers. Um, and so there was a lot of debate between the two sides of what the government should look like. Um, should the bigger states uh, be favored um, by having them get more power in the government through representation by population, or should all states be equal? And so Hamilton, in, in the play Hamilton, represented the North, Jefferson the South, and represented very different ideas. And they came up with a compromise. It's something we have a lot of difficulty doing in the United States today. But back then, um, we came up with compromises to try and come up with middle ground solutions. And so the compromise that Jefferson and Hamilton and who they stood for came up with was that our Congress was going to be split into two parts. It was going to be a bicameral legislature with two houses. The House of Representatives was going to represent all of uh, the people and every state was going to get the number of representatives in the House that was proportionate to their size in population. The Senate, on the other hand, was going to favor the smaller states. So every state would get two senators, regardless of the amount of population they had. And this is how we came up with our Congress, one part for the smaller states, one part for the more populous states, um, and they would have to balance each other out. Now, uh, when we got to voting for president, we took that same compromise and put it together. So the voters in the smaller states would have disproportionate weight when it came to electing the president. So for example, in your, if you are in Wyoming and you have a single vote there, you have a lot more sway as one person over who's gonna become president than if you're in a state like California where there's so many more people. Um, so kind of keep this in mind because it really dictates how the campaigns are being run. The second thing to keep in mind, which will probably come up in Q&A if you want, is that when we vote for people in the United States, we don't vote for the president directly. So when I cast my ballot, I don't cast my ballot for Joe Biden or Donald Trump. I cast my ballot for somebody who's then going to vote for Joe Biden or Donald Trump, depending on which way I vote. A little complicated, we'll skip that for now, but we can talk about that more later um, if you'd like. So if we fast forward to today and we have the Electoral College, we have uh, 538 votes total. So every state gets their number of people in the House, plus their number of senators, which is two. You combine those together. Um, you add in the District of Columbia, where I used to live. And so you end up with 538 votes. And to win the Electoral College, you have to win half plus one. So that would be 538 divided by two plus one is 270. So whoever gets 270 electoral votes, or more, they become the president. And this is the rules of the game that the two campaigns play by and have always played by um, since the beginning of our country. So you need to know the rules to understand the game. And here's a, a quote uh, uh, that explains this. In the Electoral College, which by the way, when you run a race, if you're running electoral, you know if you go by the college, electoral college, that's a much different race than running popular vote. And it's like the 100 yard dash or the mile. You train differently. That's something that President Trump uh, recognized. Um, he said it's genius because it brings all the states into play, including the smaller ones. And you campaign much differently when you're campaigning for electoral college votes as opposed to the popular votes. So, so Donald Trump 100% right about this. So now, now that we have our background, let's go into where we are today. To know where we are today, you have to go back to the last election. So in the last election in the electoral college, Donald Trump beat Hillary Clinton 306 to 232, because the states he won added up to 306, uh, three, uh, 306, and the states Hillary won got to 232. Now, Donald Trump lost the popular vote, 
more Americans by almost 3 million voted for Hillary Clinton than voted for Donald Trump. But because Donald Trump won by a collective 77,774 votes in three states, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin, he won those states in the Electoral College and he became the president. And so this is the map that the two campaigns are working off of going into this race. And so some states, we know for sure who is going to win. We know that Joe Biden is going to win California. We know Joe Biden is going to win New York. We know Donald Trump is going to win Oklahoma. We know Donald Trump is going to win Alabama and Mississippi. So the campaigns don't care about those states in terms of the Electoral College. They care about the states that could swing. You know, when we talk about swing states, they could swing and blue is Democratic and red is Republican for map purposes. So they could swing blue or they could swing red. These are the states that, that the campaigns are most focused on. They're the states that Hillary had, had, had won by less than 3% or that Donald Trump had won by 3.5% basically or less. So we focus on these states. And if Joe Biden can win all of the states Hillary won just, and just pick up three new ones, if he can pick up either Arizona, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, he can pick up three of those four. He becomes president. So those become the most critical states to watch. In the Electoral College, instead of people campaigning over the country to get the most votes, they campaign in these critical swing states. And these are the four most critical swing states, these four that, that Donald Trump had won. And so now we got to try and figure out, well, how is Joe Biden going to try and win them? How is Donald Trump going to try and win them? Joe Biden, his way to win is to get people to vote for him who voted for Barack Obama, but didn't vote for Hillary Clinton. There are 12.7 million people who voted for Joe Biden and Barack Obama in 2012 who didn't vote for Hillary Clinton in 2016. About half of them, 6 million, voted for Trump. But 4.4 million didn't even bother to vote at all. And 2.3 million voted for a third party candidate last night. Joe Biden, if he can get these people to come back and vote, he is going to win. And so this is what he's focused on and he's focused on them in those critical states that we just talked about. So if you look at, at, at young people, right? And this is, you know, those 18 to 24 year olds, the youngest, the youngest people who vote, they didn't come out and vote in 2016. As you can see, they voted the most in 64 and in 68 and in 72 when um, we had a lot of turmoil in the United States and, and you know, we had a, the Vietnam War um, was going on. Um, but then people didn't really come out to vote young people. They voted for Bill Clinton the first time in 92. Um, they voted against George Bush uh, in 2004. They voted for Barack Obama in 2008, but then they didn't vote again. Can Joe Biden get them to vote again? Can he get young people to vote again? If he can, he can win. Um, and young people vote much more Democratic than they do Republican. So if you're a newer voter, you're a bluer voter, as The Economist recently put it. Um, and so this is really critical, and it's why Bernie Sanders and AOC are doing all of this work to try and get younger people to vote this time. And younger people care about different issues than older people care about. They care about the environment much more than older people care about. They care about racial equality much more than older people um, care about. And so it's really important if, for young people to vote to change what the candidates talk about. So this is something to, to watch for um, in this race. Um, now, what has happened uh, over the last really decade in the United States when it comes to voting is we now have something called the diploma divide. It used to be if you were a college graduate, you know, you couldn't tell if somebody was going to vote for president, uh, Democratic or, or Republican. If you didn't go to college, you couldn't tell if you, that wasn't made any more likely to make you a Democrat or Republican. But from the time Barack Obama was elected through now, if you are white and didn't go to college, you are much more likely to vote Republican than to vote Democratic. And so these are the voters that Donald Trump needs to get to vote for him. If he can get the whites without four-year college degrees to vote in greater numbers in 2020, even than they did in 2016, he can win. So this is the messaging that he's going to talk about. And there are a lot of those Trump voters out there. There's 1.5 million people in Michigan 
who are white and didn't go to college, who are eligible to vote, but did not. So Donald Trump's message is aimed at that group. So Biden is aimed, right, at the voters, the younger voters and predominantly blacks who didn't vote for Hillary in 2016, but voted for, for Obama Biden. Trump is going to try and expand the number of whites without college degrees who will vote for him. Um, why is this? Why is it that we've had in the last 10 years a huge shift where non-college voters tend to be um, uh, Republican more? And I think the view is that globalization has hurt, has, has hurt whites who didn't go to college. Um, if you saw the film American Factory, um, you saw a lot of that story being told. If you see you know, the factories that have been closed down in, in, in the industrial Northwest, in Michigan, in Wisconsin, um, in Pennsylvania, those are the states that typically voted Democratic, now all of a sudden vote Republican. So Donald Trump knows that he speaks to these voters much more than Hillary Clinton did, um, and that he's going to try and get them again. Joe Biden is going to try and, and prevent that from happening, but this is what Trump's game plan is. Um, so where we are now uh, is how do you get those voters out? And the question is, when a president runs for re-election, is the re-election campaign going to be a referendum on how he has done for the past four years? Uh, and there's a lot to vote against for Donald Trump in that way. Or is he going to try and make it a choice between himself and Joe Biden, like he made it a choice between himself and Hillary Clinton, and talk about issues that he has a stronger connection to the voters on. Globalization is one, uh, China is one, law and order uh, is one. So what might change the outcomes in 2020 that we don't know about? We can talk about the debates and we can talk about what's happening uh, with the Supreme Court. So these are kind of two wild cards. And of course, COVID is the third wild card. And that's something that came up in the last debate. So when you, if you watch that, and I kind of, sorry for you if you did, because it was not the most pleasant uh, of experiences for, for Americans to, to have to go through. But what were the issues in this debate, right? President, you know, the Vice President Biden, he talked about income inequality. Vice President Biden, you know, talked about, um, you know, racial injustice and whether or not the president would denounce some white supremacist organizations. Donald Trump, he talked about law and order. Joe Biden, he talked about the coronavirus and whether or not uh, Donald Trump had done a good thing. So these are the issues that they're trying to get to drive their voters out. Um, so it's really what's making up the core of the campaign. So we're going to, I'm going to stop in about one minute or so, but I just want to say that there's a lot of good information out there for you to find as a, as a younger voter or as a younger student about what's out there. The, probably the best thing to do is to go, uh, you can go to the candidates websites. So you've got the Trump website and you've got the Biden website. Take a look at those. Of course, watch TV, but there's also nonpartisan candidate guides there out there. The one I recommend you take a look at, it's called campuselect.org. Um, it is from a nonpartisan group in the U.S. aimed at college students, and what they do is they list out the issues, um, and then they do a summary of where the different candidates stand. Um, so this one is an example. Um, do the candidates support free education? You can see the position of Joe Biden um, versus Donald Trump. So a really interesting guide for you to, to, to go and take a look at what's happening. So I really recommend that. Um, and with that, I'm going to stop because I, I did a lot of information in a in a pretty short time, but look forward to having uh, any discussion um, you all want to have now. All right, thanks. Can you guys give them a round of applause? <laughs> I don't know if you can hear it, Steve, <laughs> the way the mic is. Um, so we're going to open the floor to questions. And uh, anybody out on the floor have a question about anything that Steve talked about? I'll bring the mic to you. Sometimes it takes a minute to think mm -hmm. about it. Um, I have a question for you, though, Steve. In your experience, do you think, I mean, the last week the presidential debate was unique in a lot of ways. It was quite an experience. But in your experience working on campaigns, do debates between the presidential candidates really have an influence, do you think, on voter choice? They, they certainly can. And usually they have the greatest influence um, if... Uh, one of two things happen. One, if a candidate really makes a mistake uh, at the debate, that can really come back and, and hurt them. And the, 
biggest example of that was uh, in 1976 when, when President Gerald Ford uh, said that basically Eastern Europe wasn't under the domination of the Soviet Union, which of course it was. Um, and so that's all anybody talked about in the aftermath of the debate. And that really took away some momentum that President Ford was building up and he ended up not getting reelected. This might have been a, a very bad debate um, for Donald Trump because what people were talking about after the debate, besides how, how awful it was, and it really wasn't much of a debate, was whether or not Donald Trump had sufficiently denounced white supremacy in, in white supremacist groups in the US. And so because that's what a lot of the people were talking about. Did he do it? Did he not do it? Did he do it sufficiently? Would he have to come back and do it? That took time away from Donald Trump to make the case he really need to make that he would be a better choice than Joe Biden. So it, it was kind of an error on Donald Trump's part in not being as strong as he ended up being three days later in, in making that case. So that's where the, the biggest issues you have. Now, what's interesting about the US in, in 2020 is that so many people have already made up their minds that there's so few uh, undecided voters out there right now. And so what Joe Biden and Donald Trump were trying to do in this case were to talk to their own supporters, not try to convince um, the other side, right? So Donald Trump was talking to his supporters about how he was for tough and for law and order. Um, and Joe Biden was talking um, to his supporters about what he would be doing to try and uh, be a different president and make sure that they knew they needed to come out to the vote to make a difference. Great, thanks. We have a, we have a question online, Amica's asking, if you could um, perhaps give us a little rundown on the philosophical differences between the Democrats and the Republicans. Will do. I think the, in terms of, uh, let's, we'll, we'll, we'll do foreign policy first. Um, that's a fun one for people living in this part of the world, and, and then we'll do the domestic policy. I think Donald Trump has a, his view of foreign policy, um, it, it goes into the, uh, it, it is that the U.S. needs to look out for itself, um, and the way the U.S. looks out for itself is to do so unilaterally. So the U.S. will negotiate one-on-one -on -one with different governments to get the best deal possible when it comes to the United States. Um, and that is how you put America first. Now, now, Joe Biden would say, I also believe on putting America first, but the way to put America first is to do so through a multilateral foreign policy. Let's work with everybody to try and improve how uh, you know, countries are going to do. The U.S. is going to be stronger if it's part of you know, the Paris Climate Accord, which Donald Trump pulled out of. Donald Trump said, we have to look out for the United States, so we're gonna do what's best for us from an environmental perspective. Joe Biden says, the way the world does best and the United States does best is working together. So very different views between Donald Trump and Joe Biden when it comes uh, to foreign policy. When it comes um, to domestic policy, you know, Donald Trump's messaging is you know, is very simple. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's make America great again. And how do you make America great again? You, you build the, you, you protect the people who are in the United States. How do you do that? You build the wall. Um, and so we don't have people coming in, taking away jobs uh, from Americans and we cut down on immigration. How do you make America great again? You cut out um, government and regulations and you let businesses flourish um, that way. And the more businesses flourish, um, the better the economy will do. So how do you do that? You cut taxes and, you know, everybody will do better. So that's kind of the, the, the Donald Trump approach and the Joe Biden approach um, is very different. I mean, his view is we need to build back better. And the way we build back better as a country um, is to do so by having everybody pay their fair share. So you do raise taxes for some people and then you invest that um, in the United States and the government has a lot of say in that by, for example, investing in infrastructure, but investing in 
sustainable in infrastructure and you have a lot of rules around the environment that way. So two very different approaches between the Democrats and the Republicans when it comes to both foreign policy and when it comes to domestic policy. Thank you. Okay, guys on the floor, anybody have a question? Um, do you think the outcome of COVID, I mean, the elections would be different if there, no, if there were no COVID-19? Great question. And I think the answer is probably yes. It, it, it would be a different race for sure, because the whole race now from Joe Biden's perspective, a lot of it is based on COVID, right? So Joe Biden is saying that the only way you're going to fix what's wrong with the country. What's your only way you're going to fix what's wrong with the economy, with so many people right, out of work um, and so many problems that we have with, with health care because there's so many people out of work and because they've been sick with COVID is that you have to fix COVID and that, Joe, and that Donald Trump has not done a good job. Donald Trump doesn't have a national policy. Donald Trump hasn't, man, hasn't set a good example. Donald Trump isn't listening to the scientists. So the whole race for Joe Biden, in a way, hinges on the fact that he doesn't think, and the majority of the American public doesn't think, that Donald Trump has good, done a good job on COVID. So if your question is, right, COVID didn't exist, well, then the Biden campaign would have to be totally different than what it is now. Um, if, the, if COVID didn't exist and you would guess the U.S. economy would doing much better, that we wouldn't have so many people unemployed, Donald Trump would have a much stronger case um, for his reelection. Um, and it would probably be a very similar race to 2016. Uh, and, and it would be too close to call. Right now, Joe Biden has a huge advantage because of COVID. Now we'll see what Donald Trump can do in the last month. But it's a, a very uh, good observation to make that COVID is the entire election changer for 2020. So just tacking on to that, Steve, what are the implications of the president currently being in Walter Reed Hospital with, as COVID positive? What do you predict as an, an impact? Well, there's, there's you know, two different ways this is going to go. Um, and the, 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 the Biden, I think, narrative will be or the, the 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 narrative will be look if donald trump couldn't even you know take put put rules in place to protect the white house couldn't even put rules in place you know to protect the republican party how can he put rules in place to take the country to, to protect the country if he couldn't even do the job to protect himself um so i think that is the you know the narrative that a lot of people will try and, and say that this is another example of the president not having the right policies in place to address COVID. Now, I think the, the Republicans, you know, will say we've got to come together as a country right now. We need to have everybody supporting the president. Um, and certainly you look at, you know, Joe Biden, Barack Obama, all wishing, you know, good health for the president. Could there be some type of coalescing around the president at this time of, of need. That's, that's a possibility. It happens less and less now, um, but that's, you're gonna see those kind of two tensions play out over the next 30 days. I, I stole someone's question, so <laughs> sorry about that. All right, you ready to go? Okay. Um. Do Americans that live outside of America have the right to vote? That is a, a, a good uh, question. The answer is yes, and the answer is, but they don't often use it. So if you are a US citizen, you have the right to vote. So for me, um, because I lived uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, before I came here. I get to vote in Washington, D.C. because that was my last address. So my son Bennett, who's, who's 20 years old um, and is helping me out with some of the slides, so he put this one up. Um, so Bennett goes to, to school in Colorado. 
So Bennett has the option of voting either in Washington, and he's in Singapore now because of COVID, so he's not back at school. So he has the option of voting either in Washington, D.C., because that's my last voting location, or he can vote in Colorado because that is where he lived last year um, when he went to school. So what you need to do is if you are an American who lives overseas, you need to register to vote. And it's really pretty easy uh, to do that. So if you, it's, although it's getting late, I don't know, some states it might be too late to register now. So if you haven't, uh, if your parents haven't, make sure they have, they can go to this website, votefromabroad.org. And it's really easy to figure out where you register, how you register and, and to get yourself registered. Now to, to, to go on to the second part, the problem is not enough Americans who live overseas vote. And there are roughly 3 million of us. So there's about 3, millions Ameri 3 million Americans, 18 and above, who live overseas. But in 2016, only about 210,000 of us actually voted. So that's a 7% turnout. And that's terrible, right? That's pathetic. Uh, and so what happens when you don't vote then the people who live in Washington and, and run the government don't care what you think, because if you're not voting, then, uh, then they don't have to worry about you when they run for election. So if more Americans voted who lived overseas, then maybe they would think more about Americans who live overseas when they govern. Um, and so it's really important that we all vote. And it's important that you tell your parents and your, your aunts and uncles and anybody else wherever they live uh, to vote. Uh, I don't understand why people in smaller states think it's unfair um, if you like if they count just how many people vote in all instead of like the electoral college. Okay, great. So here's so this was the worry back when the during the days of you know, Thomas Jefferson and, and George Washington and Alexander Hamilton. So the worry was that in, in the US, you had more people who lived in cities, right, than lived in the countryside. You had more people who, who were in business than, than were farmers. Um, and so if you had a, uh, a, a Congress that only was based on how, how many, where people lived, a state like New York would have a lot more votes than a state like Virginia. Um, because even though they're about the same size geographically, um, they have very different interests. And so the people who lived in the rural states and the people who lived in the smaller states like Rhode Island um, you know, and Delaware, they all said, it wouldn't be fair if we just said, okay, there's you know, a million people in America, everybody gets one vote. And so whoever gets you know, half a million in one votes is going to be the president. So they didn't want to do that. The smaller states felt that their rights weren't going to be protected and the farmers felt their rights weren't going to be protected. So they came up with this compromise um, and they used that same compromise where in the smaller states have an advantage in the Senate and the larger states have an advantage in the House. And that when it comes to voting for president, they kind of mushed everything together. And so that's where we are today. So if you live in California, California has many more electoral college votes, as you can see on this map, they have 55. And if you live in you know, a small state like North Dakota or South Dakota, you only get three. But as an individual, your vote means more in North Dakota uh, than it does for a single person in California. So it gets to be very complicated. And what people think, especially people your age tend to think, is that this system is crazy. And that, yeah, maybe it worked in the 1700s and the 1800s, but it doesn't work uh, in, in the 21st century. And we should get rid of it and come up with a new system. And maybe by the time you're my age, we will have gotten rid of the Electoral College and it will come up with something that's a, a little bit more fair and, and proportionate. Uh, Steve, Hillary Clinton won the popular vote. And can you think of other elections that had a similar outcome where the person who became president did, in fact lost the popular vote, but won the Electoral College? 
and, and it, it's, it's happened, I think, four or five times in, in history, and it's happening a lot more lately because, there's, because the U.S. has become such a divided country. And where you, so states like California um, in New York are now much more democratic than they've ever been. And then Southern states like Arkansas, Alabama, Georgia are much more Republican than they've ever been. Um, but because you have this tilt in the electoral college to those smaller states, um, what happens is you get somebody like Al Gore beats George W. Bush in 2000 in uh, the popular vote, but he loses um, in the electoral college. Donald, you know, 16 years later, Donald Trump beats, uh, you know, loses to Hillary Clinton um, in total votes, but still wins in the electoral college. And so we really have a, a problem in the U.S. And it's a problem because people are so divided now. And there's so many different reasons for this. Some of it is media. And so now instead of everybody, you know, when I was you know, a kid, we all watched, you know, the network news. Now everybody gets their own news on social media or from their own channels. And so there's so much disagreement and where you live now is very partisan too. Um, and so I will guarantee, I, I won't guarantee much about the 2020 election, but I will guarantee Joe Biden will beat Donald Trump in the popular vote. The question is, will Joe Biden get enough of the electoral college to win or will the same thing happen again where a president is elected with fewer votes than his opponent. There's one time in history, and it was in 1876, that a person actually not only won the popular vote, but got a majority of the vote, got more than 50% of the vote and didn't become president. It's, it's possible Joe Biden could get more than half of the people of the country to vote for him and still not be president. And that would be very bad, uh, a very bad outcome socially. Right. And if, but changing the Electoral College obviously is a huge process because it would require an amendment to the Constitution. And that's in the very, that in and of itself is also a very complicated process where the legislature probably wouldn't be too eager, at least if it's controlled by the Republicans, wouldn't be eager to go down that route. So um, any other questions on the floor? Yeah. Is there one on? online i'll tell you i've got i've got one bennett why don't you put up what we call the blue shift slides because this is going to be a very this has never happened before um and it's so it's something that you really are going to want to watch um uh this year and so the the um what's happening now uh it's 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 a very it's 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 unique is to um uh is to previous elections so there's something called uh, the, the blue shift. And blue, remember, means democratic and shifting. So it means that the race moves towards the Democrats. So in 2018, so just two years ago, there was a Senate race in Arizona. And on election night, the Republican had more votes than the Democrat. But by the time all the votes were counted and all the mail-in ballots were counted, the Democrat ended up winning. And so the Democrat won pretty easily with a majority, actually she got a majority of the vote um, after all those mail-in ballots uh, were counted on election night. And in 2020, so in the, demo, in the primary in Michigan um, this year back, I think it was in June, um, uh, it was a couple months ago, on election night, when people who voted on election day, when their votes were counted, the Republicans had 10% more than the Democrats. But by the time all the mail-in ballots were counted in the next few days, the Republicans were way behind the Democrats. And so we call this the blue shift. And, and it turns out that Democrats vote much more by mail than Republicans do. Um, and that's going to be even more pronounced this year than in previous years. And that's because the Democrats are telling their voters to vote by mail. And Donald Trump has been telling his voters that voting by mail is fraudulent. You shouldn't vote by mail. So you're going to see a lot more mail-in ballots from Democrats than from Republicans. And so what's going to happen on election night is uh, what each state does is, I think the, the thing to keep in mind is that we have 
Um, not one national election. We have 51 elections right, on election day. And so what's gonna happen on election day is that all a lot more Republicans than Democrats will vote. So when they announce the results on election night, then the Republicans could be ahead. But then, and, and what Donald Trump will probably do, and certainly what he did in 2018, will say you have to stop counting the vote on election night because all the other votes that are coming in by mail could be fraudulent, um, they could be forged, um, and he's gonna wanna see that vote count stop um, on election night. And that is going to be a real um, challenge if state officials listen to him because there's going to be millions and millions of votes that, that, that don't arrive until election day or maybe even a day or two later. And we're not gonna know who's gonna be president possibly for a week or two weeks until after election night. We've never really had this happen before in the US in modern times. Um, and so what could possibly happen um, is that Donald Trump could lose the popular vote, could lose in the electoral college, but if he gets those votes and, and if state officials stop counting them, um, he could win. And so this is really setting up um, a, a very uh, tense period in the US uh, if Joe Biden doesn't win outright um, on election on election night. So it, it's something that we're going to be spending a lot of time watching. Yeah. And and the, if the states do stop counting the votes, it's quite possible that someone could challenge that decision or that order through the court system, which would further delay the possible outcome for the courts to hear those cases and decide whether or not that was permissible or, or constitutional that the president asked them to stop counting the votes. Yeah, and maybe Bennett put up one more slide with all the different dates. So, uh, so yeah, so we remember. Um, I think that so so a couple things to keep in mind is that our system isn't set up for people to win to know who wins on election night. Because if you remember going back to that that slide I talked about uh, at the very beginning, when I vote, I'm not actually voting for Donald Trump or Joe Biden. I'm actually voting for an elector who will then vote for Donald Trump or Joe Biden, depending on how I vote. And this is because if you go back to the, you know, the, the, the history of the United States, you know, we were very discriminatory uh, when, when our country was founded. Obviously, you know, we had slavery. So you know, certainly slaves couldn't vote. Slaves didn't even count as, as a full person uh, when it came uh, to counting the, the population for terms of voting. Women couldn't vote. Most white people couldn't vote. Only property owners, for the most part, um, could vote. And even the founders didn't trust that limited amount of people to directly elect the president. So those people voted for somebody, and they're called electors, and they go to the, to the electoral college um, to cast that final vote. Now, the electoral college, it's, it's not a building. So if you ever go to Washington, D.C. and ask to see the electoral college, you're not going to find it. It doesn't. It doesn't uh, exist. It's a process, um, and so the way our process works is on election day, the votes get counted. The people who vote on election day or have voted earlier, and then all of those mail-in ballots come in. And it's not until December 14th that the electoral college delegation actually meets and, and votes. So there's six weeks to figure all of this out. So if you're in the state of Pennsylvania, for example, Pennsylvania will count the, the ballots and then they will count the mail-in ballots and then they will figure out who won and then those electors will go to the electoral college uh, and they will vote uh, for uh, Joe Biden or Donald Trump. And, you know, so Meredith, to your point, if they try and stop counting the vote on election night and they don't count in Pennsylvania all of those votes that come in by mail, there are going to be a lot of lawsuits. And you could have a lawsuit in Pennsylvania and you could have a lawsuit in Wisconsin and you could have a lawsuit in Florida and you could have a lawsuit in North Carolina. And then you have about six weeks under the Constitution for these results, for these lawsuits um, 
to, to, to play out. Um, and it could go all the way to the Supreme Court like it did in 2000. Hopefully none of this is gonna happen, but we're spending a lot more time thinking about all of, all of these uh, potential outcomes than we ever did before. Okay, so I have a couple of questions online. While we're thinking about these potential outcomes and different scenarios that we haven't really faced before, um, what do you think might happen? What's the implication of Donald Trump being sick during the election season, the election process? Um, and what happens if he doesn't recover by election day, let's say, or, or by uh, December 14th when the electors vote? Okay, so there's kind of two different rules um, that we have. And, and this is, it's happened before in Senate races and in gubernatorial races where, you know, there was a, a race in Virginia where the Republican uh, uh, nominee for Senate died in a, a plane crash. Um, and so the Republican party then chose someone um, to replace him um, in the election. Um, we've had people pull out uh, because of scandals in, in different states, and then the, the party gets to choose um, who they want. So there's a couple of different issues. We've never had it happen with the president before. So the, the, the first question would be, um, will Donald Trump keep all of his powers as president uh, uh, while he is, is, is got COVID? The White House has said, yes, he is going to do that. In the Constitution, um, there's something called the 25th Amendment. And the 25th Amendment is when the power passes from the president to the vice president. And this was passed um, because we had a very difficult situation uh, in the US uh, when John Kennedy was assassinated. Um, at the time when John Kennedy was shot, uh, people didn't know if he was alive or or if he was dead, and he certainly, at a minimum, had a massive, you know, brain injury, and he he wasn't going to be able to function um, as president. But there was he was still alive, and what would have happened if he had stayed alive? Who would have been president? And so the Twenty Fifth Amendment was put into place to address that situation. And so if Donald Trump gets too sick to be president, he can pass his power on to the vice president or actually there's a system in place to take his power away from him if he doesn't affirmatively pass it uh, to give it to the vice president. That has never happened before in US history. So first question we have to ask is, will Donald Trump keep his power as president? We're going to assume that he does. But let's say for whatever reason, either Donald Trump or Joe Biden decides not to run uh, for president between now and election day. Then it is up to the Republican party and they have a process to pick somebody new and the Democratic Party also has a process uh, to pick somebody new. The guess would be that they would pick Mike Pence and, and, and Kamala Harris, but there's no reason that, that either party would have to do that. Um, and then if something happens after election day, but before the electoral college, remember the electors have the option to vote for whoever they want. I presume the Democrat would vote for Harris and the Republican would vote for, Trump, uh, for Pence, but you know we don't know. So it's, we're living uh, in historic, historic times. And, and so you are witnessing the most exciting and unknown and unpredictable uh, election of any of our lifetimes. Uh, uh, and and it's, it's, you know, kind of the first or second that some of you all are, are gonna, gonna recognize, but boy, we're in uncharted territory in so many different things. Completely uncharted territory. <laughs> I think the final scenario we were chatting before is then if the Electoral College meets on the 14th and confirms, let's just say Trump and Pence win, um, but then something happens that Trump isn't able to take office between the electoral vote and inauguration day, then it would go to Pence. Because but then it would be the, the party couldn't pick somebody else because it would be after the election is actually voted on by the Electoral College. Um, we had one final question. Uh, someone asked online, is uh, Kamala Harris a good VP pick? As we think about the vice presidential debates coming up this week uh, on the 8th in Asia in the morning, um, what do you think about that as a VP pick about her? I, th I think she is a great uh, VP pick for two reasons. I think the first reason is 
uh, that Joe Biden said that the most important trait he wanted in somebody that he could pick as vice president was somebody who he had, I think the word he uses is simpatico. Though it's, it's, it's somebody that he was comfortable governing with, somebody who had the same governing philosophy that he had. And I remember Joe Biden had eight years as vice president uh, with Barack Obama. And by all accounts, that was a very successful relationship. And that's a relationship Joe Biden wanted to repeat. So he took somebody um, you know, from his part of the, the Democratic Party, somebody uh, more moderate. Um, so it's clearly somebody he's comfortable with. But it's also important to remember, if you go back, Bennett, don't change the slide, but if you go back to one of those earlier slides, that the way Joe Biden wins is to get back those Biden, you know, those Obama Biden uh, voters who didn't vote for Hillary Clinton. Um, and a lot of those voters uh, were in, in two demographics. A lot of them were, uh, were black voters who just said, you know what, I'm going to stay home. Um, I, I'm not as excited about Hillary Clinton as I am about Barack Obama. And a lot of them were younger voters um, and, and more liberal voters. And what they did was they voted uh, for a third party candidate. They said, you know what, I don't like Donald Trump, but I don't like Hillary Clinton. Um, I wish it were Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren. It's not, so I'm gonna go vote for a third party candidate. And when they did polling, right after Kamala Harris was chosen, um, two, you know, three key groups, black women were 43% more likely uh, to, to uh, consider voting for Joe Biden um, because of who, because he chose her. Moderates and conservative Democrats uh, were more likely to vote for Joe Biden because he went with Kamala Harris as opposed to going with somebody like Elizabeth Warren, you know, and more liberal. And then even liberals and very liberal Democrats more likely to vote for Joe Biden because he chose Kamala Harris. So a great choice, right? When you think, what, what do you need the, the vice president? The two most important things are, can they help you win and can they help you govern? And so she seems to have been a great choice at this stage on both of those things. And I think it'll be a very, it will, I will guarantee, I'll, I don't have, I'll give you a second guarantee. I, I guarantee that Joe Biden will get more votes than Donald Trump, not that he'll be president, but he'll get more votes. I guarantee the, the Mike Pence, Kamala Harris debate will be very different than the um, uh, one between Donald Trump and Joe Biden. I think it'll be a, they'll be much more respectful. Uh, they'll be much further apart. Uh, they've already said they have to be at least 12 feet apart, not not uh, seven feet apart, and it is going to be more substantive. And I think, you know, one of those questions, what do Democrats stand for? What do Republicans uh, stand for? You're going to have a much better understanding of it from this debate between Pence uh, and Harris than unfortunately you would have from uh, Trump and Biden. Agreed. I'm, I totally agree with you. Okay, so we're going to take one last question and then we're going to wind up. Okay, so here I come. All right. Um, why do they even count the other votes if they only choose the president based on the electoral college? Okay, so they count, they'll count all the votes in every state because re remember the electoral college, has, it, it comes from the popular vote. Um, so the popular, so remember, let's say we have 51 elections right, happening simultaneously in the United States. Some of them are already underway. So what happens is on, uh, so let's just use uh, New Jersey. We'll pick New Jersey as a, that's where I went to high school. So use New Jersey as, as an example. So th the people who vote in New Jersey will, will vote by mail or they will vote early or they will vote in person. Then all of those votes get counted. Then whoever wins and then there's going to let's say so let's say joe well joe biden will definitely win new jersey so joe biden will win the vote within new jersey so he'll get more votes in new jersey than donald trump does there is a slate of electors who are pledged to joe biden and there's a slate of electors in new jersey who are pledged to donald trump because joe biden got the most votes that joe biden slate who's pledged to him will then vote in the electoral college for Joe Biden. And so it's, it, it, the, so it's, a, the, the, it's a little bit complicated, which is why we should come up with a different system. I'm counting on you guys to make that happen one of these days. Um, 
but that's the way it works. So the electors are pledged based on who voted in New Jersey and the Pennsylvania electors are pledged based on Pennsylvania and Texas for Texas um, in the like. And I, I won't go down this rabbit hole, but there was actually a Supreme Court case recently where what happens if one of those electors becomes unfaithful and doesn't follow the votes of the people and, and that's not really allowed. So it, your vote really does matter um, and it, 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 it gets pledged and it's just a very complicated system that we have. I hope that explained it a little bit. Well, Steve, thank you very, very much for all of your expertise and your time. I think it was really helpful. It's still a complicated process, but we understand it a bit better, I think, now. So if you guys wouldn't mind giving a round of applause to Steve. And I'm going to invite our club president back up to close up our proceedings. Thank you guys for coming. I hope, uh, I hope this kind of incentivizes you to be engaged, and whenever you can vote, you should do it. Thank you, Meredith. Can we get one more round of applause for Meredith and Steve? Well, all the great stuff they actually did. So thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. Um, it was great for not only having questions from the audience as well as questions here from the group, see you guys engaged. That was great. And again, one of the things I always say is to be engaged is to be informed. And what Meredith and Steve did for us today, I think is fantastic. Um, as you know, um, I think it was mentioned October 8th, so this Thursday will be the vice presidential debate between Kamala Harris and um, Vice President Pence. Uh, we will be broadcasting that as well. We'll also have our logistics booths. So again, if you can vote or your parents vote and you haven't voted, uh, you will be able to vote um, and it should be a good day. So, and more importantly, I'm um, sorry, Ozzy's dad introduced us to pollhero.org. So we'll actually have a presentation same way 45 minutes before um, and it's basically what Gen Z is doing in this election, uh, which is pretty fantastic stuff. Kennedy Mattis will be speaking. She's a sophomore at Princeton, and she'll tell you all the stuff that uh, they're basically doing in terms of gathering poll workers of the day. So anyways, thank you very much. Enjoy your weekend, and uh, enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Thank you. 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 Thank you.